The Lord is my light and my salvation. Psalm 27. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high up on a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. How many can say the Lord has been your help? You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me. O oh God of my salvation, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O oh Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. God knows where you're at and what your needs are. He doesn't miss the smallest detail. Our world is going faster and faster and faster and faster and no one is finding peace except those who stop and trust God and wait on him to do what he has promised. Remember this. God says, I will never fail not one of my promises. How many believe that God is able then I encourage you. Don't be overwhelmed and pressed by the stuff of life. Take time to wait on the Lord. Just turn things off. Turn the schedule off. And spend time, even if you don't have the strength and the voice or the emotion to worship, turn on some good worship music and close your eyes and lean back and set your mind upon the Lord and say, Lord, I trust you. You know what I need and you're the only one that can and is able. So I'm just gonna wait on you and praise you for the answer. Amen. Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Tell God your needs and don't forget to thank him for the answer. Amen. And don't worry. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, thank you for being here with us this morning.
And we turn our hearts towards you today. And we extend our faith. We awaken our conscious faith that you have given us. And we put our confidence and trust in you that while we're here this morning, through your Holy Spirit, your word, and in the midst of our worship, minister to us and in us, in our families. Speak the peace that only you can give. And give us, Lord, thankfulness and gratitude in our spirit that you never fail. You have never failed anyone that has put their trust in you. So we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, wonderful privilege to come to your house and to spend time with you this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. If you don't feel like standing, you're fine to sit and relax, but let's worship. Uh, we're going to just sing today from our head again. Our, we're short again this morning. But we'll sing songs that you already know. We're going to start with this one. It says, I will sing and praise the Lord for he is so good. That's what it says. I will sing and praise the Lord.
out. <clears throat> We're going to sing one hymn out of our book this morning, Living by Faith. Page 260, Living by Faith. Hebrews tells us that Abraham had faith, even though he didn't see the promise, <coughs> and it was counted to him for righteousness. So it must be important. <laughs> This is a good one, too, and this will help us today. 317. When Heather was a little girl, we started singing this. 
she was probably two, and she would sing Constellanskabansti, and you could not tell her that that was not right. <laughs> it was, so when we sang it at home, we sang Constellanskabansti. <laughs>
would you bring a special blessing to these people who are here today. They're honoring your word. They're honoring what you've asked us to do, Lord, and we're starting our week out in the presence of people of like precious faith and in your presence. Let it bring strength to us. I thank you for it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will bless his holy name for all my days. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
in the presence of Jehovah, Prince of Thank you for worshiping. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here today. Amen. Thank you, Don, Jim, and Sharon. Thank you, Duane. <clears throat> Over the last few days, uh, our granddaughters and uh, Nathan and Danielle lost their two uh, pets that they've had for, well, longer than the girls had been with them. And uh, the empty place that it left in their home and in their heart has been, if you've had a pet that was very dear to you, and had been with you for many years, you, you have some idea of what that feels like. <clears throat> and we were talking, to, my wife and I were talking to Caroline and Lauren, and uh, I reminded them that even though our hearts are overwhelmed with loss and sorrow, when we lose someone or something that God has placed in our life to be an encouragement, a help, a companion, whether it be human or animal. Sometimes I remember the loss of our home when I was nine years old. I was walking home from school, had heard the sirens throughout the afternoon and came home to find out the home that my family and I lived in had burnt down. All our clothes, all the things we had, possessions was gone. Just a overwhelming feeling. Uh, I think of those that have gone on before us, most recently Eva and Barbara, two ladies that were real prayer warriors and real support for the church and the pastor and his family. And I reminded them that <clears throat> scripture encourages us to think on things of good report, things that are virtuous and pure, uh, things that can brighten our heart and our perspective. And this world has a
harsh reality of loss. From the time we're born, throughout our life, till the time we leave this world, we experience good things and good relationships, I believe more often than not. I still believe, and, and you may think that I'm maybe losing it, but I'm not. I, I still believe there is far more to be thankful for than to feel grieved and sorrowful for. But when you're hurting, it doesn't feel that way. But that's when we have to remind ourselves, and I told Lauren and Caroline, think about the times that you played and the things that were fun and happy because those things can't be taken away from you. And when we have communion, usually on the first Sunday of every month, we do it, scripture teaches us to have communion, the bread and the wafer, the cup and the bread. Do it in remembrance of the Lord. But the remembrance is not his death as much as it is his life. Because he is alive. And I, I have had this battle numerous times. Through the through the years of ministry, the hundreds and hundreds of people that have passed away and the struggles of loved ones. It is, it is more than we can bear without the Lord. Sorrow can destroy. Grief is a thief. Because it takes from us the wonderful opportunity to embrace the friendship, the fellowship, companionship of our Heavenly Father, of Jesus, and of His Holy Spirit. And when we, if we're not careful, we can grieve ourselves through the opportunities that are meant for our strengthening. And instead of being strengthened, we become weak. And we lose. I remember a gentleman when we pastored in Phoenix many years ago, back in the early 80s. His wife of 67 years passed away and he all he wanted to do was die. They had no children. And they were the happiest two people that I think I ever knew. Always smiling, always encouraging everyone. But on the day she passed away, I was there with him. And it, he began to cry and cried for hours and for days, grieving. And he just said, I have no reason to live. And I say this to you because we, we are witnessing in our lives today, we're witnessing the dying 
of our nation, of the church, of morality, of truth. The list just seems to go on, and if we spend much time on it, we just say, well, what's, what's the use? Well, here's the point. Truth is still truth. It may be twisted and denied in much of the world, and morality seems to be lost for the majority of the world, at least by news and what we see and hear. But I want you to know that God still reigns. He is still truth. He is still a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And he still has a divine plan for all of our lives. And the joy of the Lord is still our strength. So if that, how many believe that that is true? Then if we are absent of the joy of the Lord, and that is our strength, What's happened? We're becoming weakened. And if we're not careful, we lose the ability to focus on things that are important and upon being aware that the Lord is trying to speak to us in moments that are strategic for the next step in our life. The hope of heaven and eternal life is well worth fighting for. Because it's going to last forever. And we don't want to minimize things that are important and precious to us. But neither do we want to allow life or death or principalities or powers, or things present or things to come to separate us from the love of God through Christ. He is with us. Amen? And I'm not trying to create something that is not specific in Scripture. But the Bible teaches us that the lion will lay down with the lamb in heaven in the New Jerusalem. There's going to be wildlife there. And I've always felt this in my spirit. There's no verse that says it, but I've always felt this. Things that were important and good in this life will only be magnified and more available than they were here when we get to heaven. Because whatever it takes to make our heart glad and happy will be there. I wouldn't be surprised if Meg and Jack will be there. I just, I look at how God created all the things he created, and he did that for our good pleasure. Why would he take those away when that was there before sin ever came? The Bible doesn't contain the whole of all the truths or of all that's happened or will happen. It's just enough to get us to know the Lord and to be ready. But I want to encourage you today and remind you it's it's important to grieve and to be sorrowful. But it also is equally, if not more important, to move past that and live a life that recognizes the value of what God has blessed you with and what you have known and enjoyed. Don't let sorrow or suffering steal that from you. Because the good things, every good, say it with me, every good and perfect gift cometh from the Father above. And if God is a good God, a good Father, He's a good, good Father, amen, 
and he has done those good things in the past, don't you think that he'll continue to do those in the future? He doesn't change. So, not just to encourage our family, but encourage you not to get lost in what seems to be a very dark and desperate time. Don't allow the negative to steal the positive. Amen? <laughs> Isaiah 43 is our passage that we begin with this morning. Old Testament, Isaiah 43, 18 through 21. If you found it, let's look at it. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls. Isn't that interesting? Wildlife shall honor the Lord, even the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself that they shall show forth my praise. It's worth reading again. Remember you not the former things, neither consider the things of old. It's kind of like he says, open your ears now, get your eyes open, I'm going to do something brand new. It shall spring forth right now. Shall you not know it? Do you want to see what God's going to do? Would you like to behold the glory of the Lord in the midst of all that's going on? Church, you see what's happening here? He's literally saying, don't get caught up on what has been and what has happened. I'm ready to do something right before your eyes. Amen? Some of it is a continuation. He's going to keep giving you breath. He's going to keep giving you joy. He's going to keep giving you strength. He's going to keep giving you the abilities and the resources that are going to be provided to go on. But he also is going to do something that will bring glory to his name and amazing benefit to you. Even the beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons in the isles, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people, now this is talking about you, and not just you, but all mankind. Old Testament, it was the Jews. New Testament, it's, it's every human being on planet Earth. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Everyone worships. The question is, who or what are you worshiping? What are you known for? Are you a sharp dresser? Are you an encourager? Are you an enthusiast about trucks or cars or houses or toys and trinkets? Maybe it's jewelry. Maybe it's uh, looking beautiful. 
Some of you ladies go to extraordinary efforts to have the ability to make people say, she's beautiful. There just really isn't much available for us guys. We are what we are. <laughs> but true worship, when you think of we are worshiping something, and we are known for that which we worship. Are we known for how hard we try to earn a dollar or save a dollar? Are we known for how we act, good or bad? What is the testimony of what, what we worship? True worship consists of these things, lifestyle, attitude, actions, And when it comes to spiritual things, all these things, our lifestyle, our attitude, and our actions should show forth the glory and the praise of our God, of our Heavenly Father. I want to share some truths with you real quickly. Remember this, everyone worships something or someone. If we're not worshiping God, then we're worshiping idols or some other God. Modern idols come from the form of materialism, the pleasure or the love of oneself or another. Have you ever known someone that was in love with himself? They really didn't spend any effort or time on anyone else but themselves. So they were worshiping themselves. Whatever we love becomes God to us. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Isaiah 43, 21, if we look at the amplified version of the Bible, it says, the people whom I form for myself will make known my praise. They will, by their actions, their attitude, do you remember what it was? Our actions, our attitude, and our lifestyle will show that we believe in and trust in God and everyone will see it. One man stated that worship is a feast in which God is the host, the cook, the waiter, and the meal itself. I may have been to a restaurant and paid some good money for some good food, and it was ruined by the waiter. Uh, I, my wife and I, with uh, brother and sister Reed and some of our family, were in Portland, Oregon for a general council meeting. And we had taken a break. We're headed into a very important part of the council meeting. And we took a break to go get some lunch, walked down to a restaurant, got there, and there was, uh, I believe, 12 of us. And the waiter comes with one of these great big serving trays with 12 glasses of water and four glasses of tea, I believe it was, and came to the table behind me, and I don't know what happened, but dumped 16 glasses of ice, water, and tea right on top of me. I had my best black suit on, my good shoes. I had tea and my uh, tea and water and ice in my pockets, in my cuffs, my shoes. By the time I stood up and tried to shake it off, my shoes were slosh, 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 slosh. I was drowned, and it was cold. 
And the guy stood there for a moment, just petrified, and all of a sudden took off running to the back. And everybody, you could hear just, a, <gasps> and I just kind of laughed. I said, well, wasn't that interesting? <laughs> Tried to shake it off and went to the back and used as many paper towels as was in the thing to try to sop it off of me. And, and I, I got dried off at least enough I could go sit down. We were over an hour the way traffic was from our hotel. There was no way for me to go. The owner came out and said, oh, I apologize, I'm so sorry. I'm so, I'll pay for your clothes to be cleaned. Or whatever. If I had to replace, whatever, I am so sorry. And the guy would not come back out. And finally, I told him, I said, ask him to come back out, please. And I told him, I said, don't worry about what happened. It was an accident. And the owner made a comment that he had never seen someone that did not get angry when something like that happened. I'm so glad that I had the composure not to allow the timing of it, what was going on, the pressure, not being able to get clothes to change into, all the variables but there could be a testimony about someone who can control their emotions no matter what's happening. Now, I haven't always been able to do that effectively. But how many feel like it's important to remember who you are as a Christian? The old saying of what would God do? I, I honestly can tell you I don't have the time to think about what God would do when something happens unexpectedly. Hopefully I am in enough relationship with the Lord that I will just do what a believer would do. Because it's worship. Your actions and attitude and lifestyle defines what's important to you. Colossians 1, 12 through 20. Your hearts can soar with joyful gratitude when you think of how God made you worthy to receive the glorious inheritance freely given to us by living in the light. He has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom and realm of His beloved Son. For in the Son... All our sins are canceled, and we have the release of redemption through His very blood. He is divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God, the firstborn heir of all creation. For in Him was created the universe of things, both in the heavenly and the earthly realm. All that is seen and all that is unseen, every seat of power, realm of government, principality, and authority, it all exists through him and for his purpose. He exited, he existed before anything was, and now everything finds completion in him. He is the head of the body, which is the church. And since he is the beginning and the firstborn heir in resurrection, he is the most exalted one, holding first place in everything. For God is satisfied to have all his fullness dwelling in Christ. And by the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. Now why is that important? Because it tells me that the plan of God is to bring us all who trust in Him, believe in Him, and follow Him 
Are you with me? Bring us back to the way it was before sin came into the world. If every good and perfect gift comes from the Father, amen, and it says, I change not. And he says, I will restore to you that which has been taken away. That's a promise of God. It gives to me the assurance that if I put God first in my life, at some time, he's going to make everything right. And everything that has caused sin, sorrow, suffering, and death is going to be undone. And he's going to bring us back to a place where the good things that he gave us are going to be there. I think it's important to have a heart to worship the Lord. And that which we give our actions and our attitude and our lifestyle too determines who we're worshiping. If you're a person that the way you treat everybody else is measured by how you want things or how you don't want things, and it's all about you. You have become a God to yourself. Because to worship God, you must love Him first and then love others as you love yourself. Say this with me. Everything, one more time, everything, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, nothing, which includes everything, cannot separate us from the love of God through Christ his Son. The things that we go through were never intended to defeat or destroy us. They were intended to remind us that we need the Lord because he's the only one who can make right all the wrongs. And he's promised to do that in eternity. Thank you, Father. Hebrews 1, 6. And when he had brought his supreme son into the world, God said, let all of God's angels worship him. Isn't that an interesting verse? When God had brought his supreme son into the world, who is Jesus, he said, let all God's angels worship him. In Matthew 2.11, they entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In Matthew 14.33, then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. <coughs> Philippians 2.10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Jesus. Say it with me. Jesus is worthy of our worship. And what is our worship? It is our lifestyle, our attitude, and our actions. John on the Isle of Patmos was there for the word of God's sake. 
He was exiled. He was suffering. He was dying in great pain, exiled. But he was there for God's sake and for the testimony of Jesus. That's what Revelation chapter 1 says. We look at 5 of Revelation 8 through 14. And when he took the scroll, the four living beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with the... Let me go back. Is it important to pray... Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. They are ever before the Lord. You pray it, and it's there, right in God's eyes. That prayer needs to be answered. And the angels are the caretakers to guarantee that they are there before the Lord. Verse 9, they sing a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals open. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people, of God, people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked again and I heard voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea they sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. Did you catch that there where it said there were how many? The voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and living beings and the elders and things on the earth and in heaven and under the earth, they were all singing worship to the Lord. The Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah and 45, 21, where he says, There is no other God besides me. I am a just God. I am a Savior. There is none besides me. In Isaiah 40, 28, Have you heard? Have you ever understood that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth? He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. Then Romans 1, 25. They traded the truth about God for a lie. That's what's happening in our world. I don't know. It, uh, it's not just wrong and disturbing. I am astounded. The word flabbergasted doesn't even begin to identify what's happening in our world. And people are accepting the lies for truth. It's because they have given themselves over to worship themselves rather than God. Yeah. 
And it's proven by their actions, by their attitude, and by their lifestyle. They've literally lost their minds. There are some hindrances to true worship. The one, the first, is pride, Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. This is Satan talking, Lucifer. He was the worship leader in heaven. And he decides he is going to overthrow God. He turns God's creation against him. And look at what the world is today. They deny God. They deny morality. They deny biblical truth. And they have lived sensually, doing what pleases them and gratifies their self and their human thinking and desires instead of worshiping God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Sin and pride are the two issues that God says will destroy our perspective of right and wrong. And it will cause us to deny the validity of God and his word. And it will cause us to give ourselves over to believe the lies of the flesh and the world to the point that we will face damnation. Now, as I come to a close, there's three things that I want to give you that help us to focus on God. And this is important, church. And this is something that I ask you to consider because it's based upon God's word and it's what God would have his people to do. Number one, worship God when you're together. Not just in your closet of prayer, not when you're on your own, but when we come together to, in the house of the Lord and when you're together with your family, take time to worship God together. Now I'll just give you Psalm 133. That's the passage that validifies and solidifies the importance of worshiping God when you're together. Take time to be holy. You are never more holy than when you are worshiping God. How many heard what I said? Number one important, when we are together and when you're at home together, take time to worship God together. Let people hear you. Let people see you. Amen. Let your lifestyle show forth praise to the Lord. Let your 
attitude show forth praise to the Lord. Let your actions show forth praise to the Lord. And that's not just when you come to church. That's day and night, seven days a week. Be a worshiper. Because if you're not doing it, you are allowing the world, the flesh, and your, your own flesh, and the Satan to come in and corrupt your perspective and your emotions and change who you are. Number two, you need to, sh to show by your lifestyle, your actions and attitude, worship to new believers and to unbelievers. You be a participant when we're worshiping. By your lifestyle, your actions and attitude. And do it in such a way that it brings such glory to God that new converts and unbelievers see that you are genuine. That you just don't claim something. They see actions that convince them you worship the Lord. You love God. You're not ashamed of the gospel. And number three, let it be a constant witness. It can't be just a momentary when you're thinking about the Lord or when someone's talking to you about God, let it be constant. Instant in season and out of season. Be unashamed and unafraid to live your faith and to cause your faith to control your actions and your attitude. True worship honors God. True worship strengthens the church. True worship impacts the world. What does the word say? Let your light so shine that they will see what? Christ within you because you are a bold, proud worshiper of the Lord. Again, verse 21 of Isaiah 43, I have made my people for myself and they will someday honor me before the whole world. It's time for us to honor God. It's time for us not only to do it when we come to church. But when we're not in church, when we're with our family, when we're alone, when we're with unbelievers, wherever we are. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. First Peter 2, 9, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Honoring God is the number one focus of worship. It is the number one purpose of a believer's life. We honor God with our lifestyle, with our actions, 
and with our attitude. Listen to these thoughts that I have provided for you today. Sincere worship pushes back the forces of darkness. Sincere worship pushes back the forces of darkness. Sincere worship produces growth in your spirit man or woman. Sincere worship strengthens our testimony. It builds up the body of the church. Worship ignites spiritual vision. Worship causes the impossible to be possible. Worship strengthens, increases, and exercises your faith. Worship produces unity. That's why I say, even if you don't have a melodious voice, start making a time every day that you can to worship together in your home. We must do this with what's happening in our world. And if you can't do it at home, you won't be able to do it here. But I'll guarantee if you do it at home, you'll come here and you'll be a greater worshiper than you've ever been. Worship produces unity and worship is the forefront of our mission. We are called, created to worship God. And I worship you, almighty God. And I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. And I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. Come on, church. Let's do it together. And I give you praise for you. And I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. And I worship you, Almighty God. There And I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. And I give you praise for give you three Hebrew words, avad, A-V-A-D, say it with me, avad, one more time, avad, it's translated to mean to serve, it signifies a conscious decision of a lifestyle of commitment and allegiance. 
God has called us to make a spiritual commitment to live for Him, to show forth His praises. Amen? Avad. A lifestyle of service, commitment, and allegiance. The second one is Yire, Y-I-R-E-H-A, R-E-H, Yire, say it with me, Yire, one more time, Yire, it's to have reverence, respect, and reverence. Don't you think that we ought to have that for God? And third and last, Hava, H-A-V-A-H, H-A-V-A-H, Hava. And it means worship, a bowing down and a paying of homage. I am convinced, based upon scriptural teaching, that if we respect, reverence, and are willing to worship with humbleness and bow down ourselves before the Lord and make a commit to serve Him, the presence of God will utterly fill this house and our hearts, and this community will know about it they will see the glory of God within us. We will see it in one another and it will be an encouragement. Your family will see you commit, serve, and focus and pay faith homage to God when you worship at home. I ask you to consider making this commitment. I will worship no other thing or any other God but Jehovah. And I will worship him. And I will come to his house to worship him. And I will in my home worship Jehovah God. It will transform your life, your home, and this church, and it will impact this city. When we together worship and serve the Lord. With my hands lifted up. Let's sing it together. With my hands Lift it up and my mouth filled with praise with a heart of thanksgiving I will bless thee O Lord sing it again with me church with my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise with a heart of thanksgiving i will bless thee o lord i will bless thee o lord i will bless thee Thank
to close with the chorus, Father God, I give all thanks and praise to Thee. We can't undo nor repair this world, but we can bring our tired, broken, wounded self to the throne of God in prayer and humble ourselves before Him and give him the praise that he is worthy of. And he, he will touch us and heal us and restore us and empower us to walk victoriously in the days that we have left in this sojourn on earth. And the peoples of the world will see the glory of God in us through us as we worship Him. How many will make a conscious effort to become a greater worshiper? You won't regret it. It will bless you beyond your imagination. And it will do things in your family and in this church community that in ourselves we could never do if we just love the Lord and worship Him with all our heart. Let our lifestyle, our actions, and our attitude show forth praises to Him. Father God, I give all thanks and praise to Thee. Father God, my hands I humbly raise to Thee. For Thy mighty power and love amazes me, amazes me, and I stand Would you stand with me as we close our service and sing this again? Father God, I give all thanks and praise to Thee. Father God, my hands I humbly raise to Thee. For most blessed and happy week you've ever had. May God go with you. Don't forget to worship the Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness.